at the end of the day, it comes down to not knowing and understanding how to train people, not knowing and understanding how to hold people accountable. And like Tiff mentioned before, is being a true leader. Mike check. I'm good. Mike check. Mike check. You can read about success all day long, but if you don't put in the work, the mindset, execution, and the hustle behind your vision, it just remains a dream. When everything goes wrong, you have to take all the responsibility. We uncover what high level entrepreneurs, business owners do to rise up from hustling daily. So do what you feel passionate about, take chances. The world becomes your library to help you to become better at your craft. Join me as I share with you actionable tips to help you grow your business, learn skills, and help you level up in your self-development journey. Your number one spot for business and personal growth is the Online Hustlers Podcast with your host, Esteban Andrade. Every day I'm hustling. Hey guys, thank you for being in another episode of the Online Hustlers Podcast where we cover REI marketing conversion episodes. They're serious. As you know, we bring in players that are in the game, doing deals, absolutely crushing it. And some of these players are as passionate as me to educate other people. Today, what we have is an special couple guests. And uh, I call them the power couple. We can call them power rangers. You can call them whatever it is. They're based in Ohio. And they are actually doing deals and they're educating people in what they do. They are so special because I've been also trained on their their systems and their operations. We went through uh, a two-day seminar, two-day workshop, call it um, something that is very intimate where you were able to meet them. And I learned about their amazing sales systems and the amazing sales systems and operations that they have in their business. And I really want people to really learn from them. They, I think they are one of the few ones in the game that are real and for real bring value. Uh, a lot of people uh, have seen a lot of people from these episodes and they have all different geniuses. But I feel, I feel that two guests that I have today will be changing the game for a long time. Okay. And we have right now, we have Tiffany, hi, and Josh, hi. How are you guys? What's going on? Thanks for having us on, man. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, so you guys are from Ohio, Cleveland. Uh, that's Columbus, Ohio. That's right. Columbus, Ohio. There you go. So Columbus, Ohio, it's, uh, it's a very similar market, I would say, to just outside of Detroit, where I was, where I was living like just a few years ago. And uh, I come from Detroit, so I know the area. Obviously, you're not going to have the all these burned down houses and this unoccupied houses. Uh, but it's definitely a good market to be in real estate. But you also have been really mastering the art of being local, staying local, and not just going outside and and spending the money on having this USA wide, nationwide, statewide type of targeting. You've been mastering the art of doing this in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, how long have you guys been in the real estate business now in this in this city? Um, so we virtually wholesale and renovate homes and have rental portfolio in Columbus, Ohio and Kansas City. Um, and we've been doing this for about six years and we've been owning rental properties for a little over a decade. Okay, that's awesome. I see that both of you guys come from amazing backgrounds. Um, obviously, you both ha- are running the business. You, you guys are the power couple. And each one has a, each unique genius. And it works. Right now, you guys are about to hit uh, a four mil, multiple seven figures. And this year on the wholesaling side, this is only wholesaling. And you guys are also helping a lot of people with your coaching. Uh, what What is this background that you guys come from that really has allowed you guys to truly master this game? Yeah, I, um, so I was a corporate leader, moved up the corporate ranks, um, back for about a decade before I jumped into real estate and I moved all over the country. I was primarily in the oil industry and the building materials industry. Um, and Josh came from commercial construction. Commercial construction, eh? As you guys can not, can tell I'm Canadian. So you'll see the ad somewhere <laughs> yeah. here and there. 
Yeah. Uh, and, I, and honestly, I don't know. Um, obviously my background has a lot to do with, you know, building teams and putting an infrastructure and training coming from corporate life. Um, but I think, uh, the mindset is really like what pushes someone to become successful in entrepreneurship as a whole. But I will say that like putting myself in a corporate structure for 10 to 15 years first is really what's helped us put the organ the organization where it's at today. I feel that that's really key. A lot of people that come into this game and they want to really start making a lot of money, uh, changing it with real estate. They come from corporate. They come from the game of the nine to five or they have some sort of job in a corporation, but they don't know what they're missing in this. Uh, what, what have you exactly applied in corporate that completely can be built and completely take this to another level? in real estate? What, ex what are these skill sets or key takeaways that, that your job had? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, especially in our industry, for some reason, when I came from corporate life over to ours and you go to all these events and I feel like there's a reason why 99% of people stay like one to three man shows. And the common age of the industry is, you know, under 25 to 30 years old. They didn't have a ton of experience moving up a ladder in leadership. And the reality is you just can't build a company to be here in 5, 10, 20 years if you don't become the leader that it takes to lead people. Um, and you can only get so far without the proper infrastructure. And what I mean by that is daily trainings, onboardings, quarterly trainings, one-on-ones, audits, um, SOPs, daily meeting rhythms. These things all come from corporate life and tying in goals and all that kind of stuff. Um, and if you start in the game so early in life, you know, say between the ages of 18 and 25, the reality check is that you just never even really put yourself in the shoes to have to grow as a leader anywhere else yet. And to get past um, like the one to two million mark, in my opinion, it takes becoming a true leader. And in order to get there, you if you didn't do it in corporate life, then you definitely need a mentor to get you there because it's not something you can just wake up and overnight understand how to become a, a, good, a good leader. That's uh, that's completely true. I think that I have I have had to read a bunch of books that never came from a leadership position to help me, and I took them as courses. Uh, obviously, you came in building teams, right? And uh, well, Josh has been in the construction life, the construction world, and, but you're mastering sales. I'm not sure if in construction you necessarily learn about sales, but now you master sales. Uh, so it, I, I think that there's obviously a progress and a, a huge ladder or just the learning ropes, right? But what do you think that a lot of wholesalers that have a business in quotation marks really miss uh, and they're not doing to actually build a business? Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to not knowing and understanding how to train people, not knowing and understanding how to hold people accountable. And like Tiff mentioned before, is being a true leader. Um, you know, a lot of times people see leadership as um, a title. And you think in my small organization, if we even see it as an organization, I think that's one key miss is people don't see it as a true organization, a true company, you see it as a side hustle. Um, but in order to build this out the right way, you have to learn how to train and onboard someone the right way. You have to learn how to tr uh, hold someone accountable to the right metrics and, and ultimately create an environment that is conducive for people to grow. So leaders focus on growing people um, where managers focus on growing specific results. Um, and I think a lot of people don't understand the, the differences between the two. And we're so laser focused on micromanaging the little specific metrics, um, if we're even tracking metrics. Um, so I think those are some of the things. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to yeah. back off of that. Yeah, I mean, one thing that's just been in, astonishing to me in our industry is, well, one, they don't put enough energy and effort into recruiting. And it's the number one thing that impacts your company is the people that you put in the seat. Then you put them in the seat and you're like, oh, I didn't think that I should put together any type of formal structured training. So they come in, you probably freak out on the first day, half ass the paperwork. And then you're like, here's a script or um, just shadow me for a few days. And then I'm going to hope that you perform. And then unfortunately, half of them don't even set very good expectations on performance that are even um, managed correctly or set 
with a reason of why they were those numbers. I think that, and I, I mean, it's unfortunate, but at least 95% of the people that even come to our events, if you ask them the reason why, like, what's the tier structure pay for your, uh, salesperson. And they tell me, okay, why was that? And there's no answer. There's like no logical answer behind how we're operating. Um, and so that's really become our passion in the education industry is like helping people understand the training, onboarding and infrastructure it takes to truly run a well-oiled machine and not just a side hustle. Wow. Uh, now the leadership part not only comes from all the experience you guys had and now you're building out this monster machine in Columbus. Uh, but obviously you guys also had to learn it yourselves. You also had to go through the downs that this game gives you, which is entrepreneurship and business. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're really up and then you're really go down. Like what, how have you guys been able to really master like leadership? Like it's, so I, I feel like being a leader, it's, it's a skill. It's, it's, it's a trait that not everyone have, but like, how do you, how, how do you learn it and how do you teach it? I think the biggest thing to jump in before we talk about how we learn is that the reality is I don't have all the answers. Like I don't normally they come at us right. And, and they come at us and we're trying to figure it out on the spot when certain things happen. And that's why it's so important to have someone that's already five steps ahead of you, because without that, then you just make decisions on the fly. And that's really where it hurts you. Um, to give you an idea with that, I had a situation happen a couple of years ago that as you grow your team, HR becomes more and more and more imp important, um, you know, policies, procedures, handbooks, whatever. I had a situation happen and I didn't know how to handle it. I, I just stood there and if I would have reacted or tried to figure it out on my own, I probably would have been in a legal battle or something. And so I have an HR leader on retainer that I can call and ask these questions to. I have a mentor that's grown a much bigger company than me who's been there, done that. And so as you get past the one, two million mark, if you don't have those people to call, every decision is critical. So they can be worth thousands of dollars if you make the wrong decision. You know, I don't, I don't want that to, to get overlooked. And I really want to emphasize what Tiff was talking about there. She said, find someone who is about five steps ahead of where you, where you are and basically where you want to be. And one thing to really emphasize is why go through the same hardships, the same mistakes that that person who's already five steps ahead of you had to figure out? Why take these things on and stress out about it? Go through the anxiety of living through these experiences when there's someone out there who's already experienced them and has already put a system and process in place to make sure that never happens again. Um, and I think a lot of people, you know, they just try to figure it out and they get stuck in these situations and it, it just prolongs the process. If you find the right person, you can take what took us five years to do. You can shorten that into one and a half to maybe two years. And what else can you do with the other three years that you just bought yourself with? Imagine the exponential growth that you could have. Uh, so that's a very, very key point that Tiff brought up. And I want to make sure that doesn't get overlooked. So when it comes to the, the leadership piece that you're talking about is exactly that. Find a leader who is the leader you want to be and learn from their experience. I think it's crucial and a lot of us really share what you're telling us because if if you're in this podcast, if you're being a, a guest in this podcast, it's because you've been able to shorten that learning curve and that failure uh, has been already discovered, like why that thing didn't work and uh, already have figured out in a short time frame. A lot of a lot of people really think that I can save money and therefore that's going to be much better for me because I'm not investing or putting money into something. But are you really day, saving money, right? Exactly. You're actually paying even more with like worse mistakes, worse stress, uh, a lot of different things that happen and taking like way more time. So like that's money yeah. at the end of the day. Like, right. What's your time worth? What's your time worth? That's correct. Um, and so really right now, how are you making sure that every person that goes to results driven become a better leader? Like what are those things? Yeah. So, um, we have, uh, weekly one-on-ones and quarterly reviews that we do, but we actually hired a third party company 
um, that does monthly leadership training. Actually, while we're sitting here right now, we're missing it. Um, he's out upstairs actually training our staff right now. Uh, so we try to put them in the hands of leaders that are even much bigger than us. And then that person, um, we actually pay as well to meet one-on-one with our leadership, our leaders of our people as well. Okay. That's huge. I think a lot of people, a lot of coaches actually do not care enough to go above and beyond and actually having other leaders, other people helping them in areas that you guys are not the best. I think you just mentioned, Hey, they may be even better leaders than us and i'm and i'm and i'm paying them and i'm i'm actually making sure that they are teaching our students uh actually i think that that's one of the best ways to be an actual coach and a good mentor because it shows that you guys are caring um one thing that i want to cover that josh mentioned some time ago and i wrote it down here is um People are not measuring and, and understanding why they do what they do. They're not measuring metrics. You also said it yourself, uh, Tiffany. Why was it to your structure like that? No, like, why is it? And what are you guys doing right now? What are those things that you are absolutely measuring and that are crucial in order to make true decisions? I think it's important, especially from a sales leadership perspective, a sales management perspective, to know and understand the process. Um, and what I mean by that is if you can visualize this flow being you have a certain amount of leads, these leads are obviously opportunities that we can call. Those calls are going to lead to conversations, which will lead to quality conversations. Those quality conversations become offers, contracts, which is the end result profit, right? Right. Um, so if we can visualize this as a flow, as long as we know our conversions, we're looking at this day in and day out. We're looking at this every single week. This is giving us a true pulse, the health of this flow or our business. And if we don't know the health of our business, it's just like a doctor's checkup. If you don't go to the doctor every year to check on your health, how do you know if you're sick or not? So we need to make sure that we have an idea of the health of this flow. And then based on the, the conversions that we're seeing, well, there will be red flag indicators that are jumping out at you saying, oh, hey, there's something wrong here. So some of the things that we track are uh, the number of quality conversations that we have, we call it a process, the number of offers that we make, and the number of deals that our acquisition people are contributing. Now, I see a ton of people in the industry, they're tracking the wrong metrics. And what I mean by that is the tracking or at least have a minimum expectation on a dial count every single day or they have a minimum expectation on talk time every day. Now, the problem with that is you're really incentivizing your team to go do the wrong activities. And think of this example, and this is something that I experienced um, early on in our, in our real estate career when we had a team and I had a minimum expectation of 100 dials per day. And I would go out to the sales floor with about two hours left and I'd go to everyone and I'd say, how many dials do you have? How many dials do you have? How many dials do you have? And um, I'll never forget this one guy looked at me. He goes, oh, shoot, I only have 50 dials. I have to do twice as much in the next two hours of what I've done in the last six. So what did he do? He even said out loud, I'm going to go call the leads. It was a, a specific category called the discovery. I'm going to go call these leads because I know they're not going to answer the phone. They're really old in the system. They're not going to answer the phone, and it'll be an opportunity for me to rack up my dials. Well, I thought in that moment, I was like, that, that's not what I want you to do. I want you to go get on the phone with someone that you – that you think you can close. Um, so that was a huge light bulb for me. I'm incentivizing the wrong activities by putting a minimum expectation on this. So that's when we shifted and we said, no, let's forget that. I want you to go to the list or the campaign or the lead status that's going to get you the next qualified person on the phone who we can make an offer to and land a contract with. Uh, so we really shifted our focus to the, the um, KPIs that are actually moving the needle forward the quality conversations, the offers that we're making and the deals that we're getting. Wow. Yeah, and then on our side, um, our transaction coordinator fills out metrics from closed properties. So things like, um, and that report shows us things like how many days is a lead in the system until it goes into contract by campaign? You know, how long does it take to close on the first close, the second close? Um, what's my average cost per lead, cost per contract? Uh, and then we break that down by campaign so we can start paying attention is, you know, certain marketing channels just not working. Should we spend more on one channel versus the other? 
Um, if we aren't tracking these things and you're just operating in a fly by night company. So you guys are definitely tracking every single number in every department that you have. in your So let's start with sales, right? Josh, uh, you mentioned quality conversations. Do I don't even, up? I don't even know if like people right now that are listening would ever think I need to measure a quality conversation. Like obviously that the sales department will have like everything in the operations back end and everything. Um, but in sales, why is measuring quality conversation important to you? Yeah, the biggest thing is we want to track the activities, again, that really move the needle forward. Now, we are looking from a leadership perspective, we are looking at the dial count because at the end of the day, that's an effort piece. But I don't want my team laser focused on where do I go to go get 50 more dials. I want them to be thinking, where do I go to get the next deal? And that's where the quality conversation comes into play. If, if I'm thinking in that light, then I have a totally different answer than if I walked up to a sales guy and said, where are you going to go to get 50 more dials in the next 30 minutes? And I think that also helps, uh, for example, getting your callers or whoever is doing your follow-up and into transforming and having a mindset of a closer mindset. How can we make sure that whatever I'm doing is going to be to close deals? It's going to be, and the end result is going to help the company re receive the revenue. Right. And therefore I get my, my commissions or however, however you have a structure. That's, I think that's brilliant. Uh, for, so for every single, let's say every single type of role inside of your organization, you guys are measuring having KPIs. What's the question? Does every single role employee or just department have KPIs, uh, yes. that are measured right now? Yeah, when we make sure that they're only focused on the top three to five that move the needle forward, all the rest of the metrics are behind the scenes in leadership reports that we're making decisions on or looking for red flag indicators. Okay, awesome. So, for instance, uh, Tiffany, uh, with with the team that you manage right now, what are what are the crucial KPIs that is making maybe everything everything really move? Yeah. Um, so actually Josh runs the day to day right now. I raise all the money, the marketing and the systems. Um, as of about three to four weeks ago, I have removed myself from the day to day. Um, so I'm in every week's level 10 meeting and I'm paying attention to where's revenue, where's expenses, where's profits, what deals are closing. And then every month I have a meeting with my CFO. We look at the previous month. And I'm paying attention to what channels are making sense and what aren't. And then um, and moving and shifting money according to what the data is telling me to do. Oh, that's pretty amazing. Thanks for that share, actually. That's a huge part. When is Josh going to be fully removed? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. It's uh, it's in the works. Um, but, you know, one big thing that our focus has been this year is leading leaders. So we've talked a lot about getting yourself to a position to be a leader, to lead the frontline individuals. Uh, but in order to take that next step and truly put yourself in the, in the owner seat, you have to, you have to put other leadership in place. And that's a totally different concept when you start talking, uh, leading other leaders who are leading the front line. So right now we're in the process of grooming uh, some people into those positions. Uh, but as far as like a, a timeline, it could be three months, could be six months, could be 12 months. Um, it's, just, it's just kind of a, a week by week thing right now. We have a game plan in place and uh, we're executing on that game plan. Wow. Okay. One of the things, guys, that I actually found when I went and took the two days is that at the very beginning, you guys made sure to set the right expectations of what really this is going to take. And you guys have specific metrics that you measure for marketing channels. And I feel like people do not really think about this at all or ever uh, on the sales conversion cycles, like what it takes. You guys have measured your metrics so well that you know how much, for instance, cold calling takes, how much your direct mail takes, how much your PPC, your Facebook. Um, what has this been? Why is this a game changer? Cash conversion cycle. Oh, yeah. I'm like, what is the question? Yeah. Um, yeah, so cash conversion cycle is when you spend money today and when you get an actual return on investment on it. 
And I feel like, especially in our industry and really any industry, a, a business owner drops money and then they freak the hell out in 30 days when they're like, oh my God, I spent 30 grand last month or 10 grand and I'm not getting a return. Um, but the reality is the colder the channel, the longer the conversion cycle. So if you're doing cold calling, texting, RVM, any of those, and you drop a dollar today, the cash conversion cycle by industry standard stat is about nine months. So what does that mean? It means when I spend a dollar today, it takes about four to five months for the lead to go into contract. And then another 30 to 45 days, if you're wholesaling it, another 90 plus days, if you're rehabbing it. So if you're going to double down on marketing this month or decide to grow, just know that you won't be, you won't perform consistently from that dollar spent for months down the road. Um, and one of the big ones that's always like a shell shocker too is I just started doing really heavy direct mail last year. And, you know, my cash conversion cycle right now is about six months. So if I drop 45, 50 grand on mail this month, I'm not going to receive a ROI on it for six plus months. Now, not a lot of people can stomach 50,000 a month for six months until they can get a return on it. And that's what's going to make or break someone being in the business a year from now. Okay. Now you guys are measuring every single channel and for example, direct mail, which is taking you six months, right? About with uh, direct mail. Um, does this apply for every single market in the United States or do you think it's like depending on the market? Like does this apply for every single market in the United States? For instance, if I go to Detroit, is it going to be the same sales conversion site? The same time. Yeah, I would say that um, every marketing campaign has a pretty common industry standard stat. Okay. I would say that the states that have attorney states might even be longer. Yeah, I think it's just um, it, one that if the more educated you are, the less anxiety you'll have. And I think a lot of my students' anxiety comes around their growth where um, I mean, I'll be honest years ago when I was telling myself I was hiring, hiring more people, investing in more marketing, all these things, you know, I didn't make a ton of money on the ladder up because I, every dollar that got made got put back into continuously increasing marketing and hiring people and all that. And when I, like I said, when I spend a dollar today, I don't make it for nine months. So you can't go into it with the mindset that you will. And that's when people shut down, they have anxiety, um, they make decisions out of fear. So, or they make lack of decisions out of fear, such as hiring another person, because I always get the common response of, well, I need to make a little bit more money consistently and then I'll do this. Well, that's not how this works. This is why you need to do it so you can make more money consistently. And if you keep doing what you're doing, you're just going to keep getting the same result. Um, and so I think that when that's why someone in our industry, I mean, you have to go all in or just don't do it, to be honest with you. Um, now I think that there's definitely money to be made of doing, um, even having a career and doing a house at a time or a couple houses, cause you can buy them off wholesalers. But the reality is, is if you want to perform consistently, you've got to invest consistently, hire consistently and keep growing, or it's going to die off. In, a time like today when a recession's hitting, that's really what's going to, um, you know, take the boys from the men in the industry, to be honest, or the girls from the women. <laughs> yeah, really is. It's going to, it's going to separate them. I think a lot of people are, are just going to start dropping the, Oh, I, I want to get into the wholesaling game or, Oh, I've been in wholesaling. Like, Oh my God, like uh recession is happening. I don't have the pans, the balls to keep going. I don't understand my numbers and you're just going to, let people like you guys or people that are really into the game become even wealthier because now the opportunities are there. You guys understand it, understand it real well. Yeah. Um, I see a lot of people pulling back a little bit right now, or it's one or the other. If you're a rehabber, I see them, you know, tiptoeing and pulling back a little bit and then they're jumping into wholesaling um, because they think that that's the answer. And it makes the people who stay in the game and still rehab and do all these things, the big players, we're just going to pivot. We're just going to adjust our numbers and adjust it according to the market. So um, I just think that some of the upcoming months are really going to make or break people based on how they plan and watch their numbers. Yeah. Have you had any type of, 
hiccups lately with people calling it recession right now uh, that, that that maybe have affected you deals? Uh, no, we've uh, we've had a couple of hedge funds in the market that have paused buying. Um, but one of the biggest things we've always been strict on in our office is that we never put a contract in place with a hedge fund that we can't take down ourselves. All right. So people are still buying. There's still people, uh, buyers in the market. Maybe it will not be the same buyers, but people still doing deals. Correct. And, and what, do you, what do you say to those people that are listening and be like, wow, um, I don't think I'm going to be successful if interest rates are going up. Can't uh, buy and hold properties because like, doesn't not, it's not going to make sense. Uh, what do you say to those people? Stack your cash and get ready. There's going to be opportunities. So I cash mean, I don't, is king. Like, cash is king. And right now, are you guys doing something differently inside to... Uh, to really prepare for for that buying buying very low uh, in your company, I would say the biggest thing right now is we're not relying on hedge funds because they are pulling out literally days before closing. Um, and we've changed our criteria from an underwriting perspective. We want to make sure that when we're looking at comps, we can't speculate anymore like you used to. You used to be able to say, "Oh, it'll probably get ten or twenty over list." You can't do that anymore. Um, so we're just being conservative when we're looking at our ARVs and, and in our underwriting. Okay. How about marketing? Are you guys marketing harder, staying consistent, the same? We're actually marketing harder right now. Wow. Okay. You guys, where are you guys double dipping? Um, we're actually testing out some new direct mail stuff. Um, we're actually pulling heavier lists cause I see, what I foresee is that there will be people that will drop off because they won't understand how to pivot or adjust in a new market. Um, and when it comes to like refine, I mean, I actually saw a couple of investors this week that paused buying because their investors are freaking out. And guess what? They had to literally drop out of 20 properties they were in contract on immediate deal right there. And the people that are ready for it, they're equipped. They're going to be the ones that get to take advantage of these things. Yeah, I think um, just educa being educated and associating with the right people is going to is going to make it happen. Uh, obviously, you guys were in the uh, during the crash, but were you guys investor during the last recession? Were you guys doing investing during the last recessions? Um, no, I had just bought in rental properties at the last recession, but our, I, again, it's another one of those things where you need to make sure you have a mentor that's been through it. So right now we have a few mentors that have lived it. It's they've both lived two recessions. Um, and so that's why it's important. If you got into the game in the last few years, you need to make sure that you're looking up to someone that's adapting, pivoting, adjusting, um, and pay attention to who's growing, not getting smaller. Yeah, one hundred percent. I I think another thing that people are uh, apart from stopping marketing, uh, they also stop growing their team. Like they don't want to like have this burden of money. Uh, are you guys currently hiring? I know that last time that you guys were, uh, we I was in Columbus. You guys were hiring a lot of people, um, or is that also slowing down or just keeping consistent? No, I think since he's been here, our team doubled already. Yeah, it definitely has. <laughs> um, yeah, we've, uh, we actually have three or four more people starting on Monday too. Um, yeah, I mean, the one thing I've learned, I, I always think it's funny when I see people say, oh, I want to make a million a month or I want to do a million dollars. And then they think that they can do that with one or two team members. Um, the more people on your team, the more money you should be making. Um, and if you aren't, then you're not putting the right people in the right seats. Cause when you put talented people in the right seats, your income should keep doubling. And how do you, how do you determine what like, Hey, this person is, should be in this seat or this person like has this strength and this is what they should do. Yeah. I mean, it just depends on the role, but the biggest things we look at, no matter the role is, are they coachable? Are they hungry? Um, and do they have the skill set that we can groom because we're really confident in our training? And let's say it's a role 
that I'm not confident in training. To give you an example, I have Aiden sitting right behind the camera and he's a camera. He's the one doing all of our video production. Obviously, I can't bring someone in fresh when I have no idea how to even turn on a camera. Um, but that doesn't mean that Aiden isn't a core value fit. He it fits into our culture perfect. He's coachable. He's hungry. Um, and I think that ultimately with those traits, everyone in our office has that those same traits. And, um, and it's not just about the individual. When you recruit people that are all on the same page with those traits, it creates this massive team environment of everyone wanting to win as a team and as a unit. Um, so I can't stress the importance of making sure that someone fits your core values before bringing them into the office. That's awesome. What are you guys top core values? Well, one Tiff actually hit on this and I almost chimed in and said this, but growth is one that's very important to us. And it's so important that we invest several six figures a year into mentorship. Um, and that's how important growth is. And, and you heard Tiff talk about, you have to be growth oriented. Everyone on our team is reading books, listening to podcasts. They're in the gym. They're eating right. They're, they're focused on being the best version of themselves. Um, faith is something that's very important to us. And this is really two-sided. First and foremost, we are Christians. We are big believers that, you know, everything happens for a reason. reason. And, and honestly, we've been blessed to have an opportunity to change the lives of the people that work with us, um, whether that's from an educational perspective, the people we're educating, our employees, our vendors. Um, so. We feel truly blessed with that. Um, but also you have to have faith in, and really trust that each department and each person in each department is doing their best to get their job done. The marketing team is doing everything they can for the sales guys to be able to have opportunities to close. And the sales guys are doing everything they can to close the opportunities that marketing's created. Um, so the faith in, in both of those uh, situations, commitment is one that's very important. Um, we have seven, so I, this could take a while, but ultimately commitment is very important because you have to be committed to the team. This is a team. This is a family. And, uh, when you say you're going to do something, make sure you do it, you know, treat everyone the way that you want to be treated along with integrity. You know, that kind of chimes into that as well. Integrity is one of our core values. Do what's right at all times. Um, yeah, I mean, I can keep going if you want me to, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, at the big end of the day, uh, just a few of those are probably the most important and. Um, one of the big things in every interview that I do is Josh typically goes over the first few and then I come in and I tell, um, so when I open up every interview, if they do make it to an in-person interview is I tell them about how the company got started, the journey, the why, where we're going, um, where I see this role going ultimately. And then when we go back to core values, I tie it back to, Hey, remember when I told you about the fact that, you know, we started in 2016. Um, we went from nothing in the first six months to 40 rehabs in the first year to 165 the next year to 300 the next year. And then we launched two other companies that became multi seven figure companies and it's not stopping there. So if that's not something that attracts you, there's the fucking door. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. I mean, I feel like also the core values that you guys have attract people that want to work with you whether that's private lenders whether that's uh someone that wants to get into your program you guys being able to put that out in social media as well i feel like all the efforts that you guys are doing internally are uh, you guys are being able to document it properly and that has been able to attract things that you that you guys want i've seen you guys post even more even going stronger in documenting what you guys are looking like inside what, yeah, what I it? think it's um I think it's important if you want you just have to think about what you're trying to attract. And the biggest thing that we have focused on when it comes to documentation or social media whatever you want to call it is um I just don't fluff anything. Like here's the real cool. deal. Like this is what's really happening in our life. This is how what it really takes. Um I don't need fancy cars. I would rather sit in my house and do nothing on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> um, so like, I just, you know, I want to be real with people because I feel like when we put this perception out there, um, and people don't know that I have hundred thousand dollar cars, they don't know that I have these fancy toys. Cause I don't need to show them because when you do that, it gives a sense of anxiety that they aren't where they need to be. And the reality is that I was living with my parents four years ago. 
So um, it's okay. We've all been there and it's a part of the journey and we need to learn to enjoy the journey. And that's why a lot of times you'll continuously see me tie back of, Hey, this happened five years ago. And then this is where it took to get to today. So you'll always see me tying back the hardship because I don't ever want people to feel like they're not in a place where that they should be. You should be where you're at right now. God decided that that's where you should be. Yeah. And I think that a lot of people do see the not really what happened all the time in social media. For example, you just shared that you were with your parents a few years ago. Um, if you could document it and film, what were you feeling and how was your current state? and that you were not a million dollar company, um, that would have shown that you guys are actually real, that you went through those hoops and there is a possibility for them to also make it that way, to make to be the top one, 4% of the population. What, 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 what is it that, for instance, in four years ago, five years ago that you were living with your parents, what, what was it that, that happened down there that, that was like, Hey, I need to go back with my parents. Yeah. Um, unfortunately at the time when we first got into wholesaling and rehabbing, I made some very poor decisions to pay a contractor in advance and then also hire some pretty bad contractors on a couple other houses. And long story short, I lost a couple, I lost money on a couple houses, got into a lawsuit and, um, I was just about to drain like every penny that I had left. Um, so I'll never forget the day of sitting in my dining room with Josh, calling my parents, crying, saying like, I have to move in with you. Like, I hate my life. I failed. Like I draw, I, you know, drained all of my cash. And, uh, my dad asked me to like walk into another room and I walk in and he was like, you need to get your shit together. Um, like you got this far, like you've already figured out what not to do. And I already have been, he had been talking to me every day for a year. And he's like, I know he made the, he actually implanted this into my head back then, but he goes, now it's your duty to make sure that someday that you don't let other people go through that to get to the same spot that you're in. And so, um, not too long after that, we moved in with Josh's mom to save on money. Uh, we were working really hard and I actually just started going to a new church at that time. And I was actually walking out of church the first time I had gone to that. And I closed my eyes and I'll never forget looking at Josh in the parking lot. And I was like, man, I just had this weird picture in my head of me speaking on stage in front of hundreds of people. And like, I just, I closed my eyes at church that day. Um, actually I could picture it right now. I was in the parking lot and I just looked at Josh and I said, something's telling me right now I'm supposed to start speaking and educating. And, uh, a few months later is when I launched the virtual group, which is one of my first products. Um, and it's been history ever since, but I, I think that it's really important as a business owner or any human being to listen to your intuition and your gut feelings, uh, because they, I think they mean something. So whether it's good or bad, I think you need to listen and never go against those intu intuitive feelings. That's really powerful. And Josh, you did right, my man. You did really good. A lot of, there's a lot of couples, couple entrepreneurs or people that have a partner and they start by themselves or they start with a partner but what really made you guys a good couple like what is it that made you guys a really good business couple well I, it all happened by accident to be honest the reality of what happened was tiff literally i'll never forget this phone call she calls me one day on on a, a good friday and she goes they're walking me out of the office i just quit my job and i looked at her i was like what you just i mean tiff, she was making good money And uh, I was like, you did what? And she's like, I left. I'm not doing it. I'll figure something else out. And I was like, well, you know, if there's one person that I know can figure shit out, it's you. And uh, and sure enough, you know, she's like, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, we kind of spent a few months figuring out what we we're going to do. And then next thing you know, she's like, hey, I'm going to go. I'm going to flip houses. Well, I was a project manager at the time, really an account manager for a commercial contractor. And um, I was like, well, you know, I can help with that. You know, I, I do the construction side of it already, so I can just manage that. I can manage the cruise. And so th there we go. You know, we off into the real estate realm. We went and um, I, I think we just naturally, you know, she, are, she was a natural for marketing. She's a marketing genius. And um, I was good at construction and 
we both had, you know, one of us had to figure out sales. You know, if he you, thinks he was good at construction. If you if you get the <laughs> <laughs> if you get the phones ringing, you got to know how to have the conversation. And really, one of the realizations we had right off the bat was Tiff did a phenomenal job getting the phone ringing. Actually, got to a point where it was calling her phone, and she was like, she'd throw the phone at me. Hey, answer it. I don't want to. I don't want to talk to them. You know. And uh, so I would answer the phone, and I'm like, man, you know, I'm having a ton of conversations. We're going out to a lot of houses, but we're not getting deals. And I realized that the, the way I was talking to sellers was wrong. And uh, this is something I see a lot in the industry. A lot of people ask, you know, what's the magical list? What's the magical marketing campaign or channel? And the reality is there's no magical list. There's no magical marketing channel. They all produce leads. They all create opportunities. What you need to focus on is your conversation that you're having with the seller. Because every single opportunity that crosses your desk, you have to be able to close it. And uh, we just, you know, over time, just through reading and self-educating, got to a point where implement this, something I'd learn, implement that. And then over, you know, a span of five years, now we've got this uh, well-oiled um, machine of a sales process and, and it's cranking out like crazy. Yeah, I mean, we have totally different personalities. And I think anyone that comes to our event, notice, you know, picks up on that. But I am 100 miles an hour. I am a numbers person. So I make all of decisions in my life, personally and professionally, based on facts. I am, I love turning one into two, two into four, four into eight. Um, I love raising money. There's a lot of things that I love doing. And then there's, you know, things that I'm not that great at. I'm honestly, I'm getting better, but I'm really not the greatest. Um, probably the people leader. Josh is a phenomenal leader. He loves um, getting people to buy into a vision and be, become a unit and a team. Um, and I, I will say I've struggled with that my whole life. I've always just been kind of in my lane and run a mile, hundred miles an hour. And that's, and I, and that's okay. I have a really good skill set in certain things, but, um, and that's why I have COOs in place. You know, fortunately one of them is my husband and he fits that role very well. And I have a COO on my education side and any company that I have, I have someone else in place to, um, counteract my weaknesses, you know? Um, and I'm really good at driving that vision, that strategy, that next step and having those conversations that move the needle forward. Um, but I know that my weaknesses in, you know, building and leading people sometimes. So that's why I put the right people in place to do it. What would you say to people that really want to work with their couples? But they don't think that, hey, their couples are going to go into entrepreneurship. Now, if there's one person that does, but the other is not working, what would you, how would it. you recommend? You wouldn't do it? I mean, at the end of the day, you don't want to force anyone to do something they don't want. I, that, that just would not be a good fit for either party, you know? Um, maybe there's a way in which the person who doesn't want to be a partner can be at least a role. That's something I would no. say we can consider that. But if, if they're not interested in that, then just completely separate it. Yeah. I see, uh, I see couples in the industry where like one of them tries to force the one into the company or get them to be an admin or do whatever. Um, and here's the reality. Like people ask us, how do we separate work and, and personal life? We don't like, we love eat, breathe. Like we, that's our passion. It's our hobby. It's our love. Like, why would we separate it? We want to combine them and make them one. And if you have a significant other that's not in love with it like that, then you truly do need to keep it separate to keep your marriage and relationship strong. I think it is very, very true. And a lot of people really want, oh, I want my wife to really work on my business because I'm struggling or something like that. But rather hire, right? I mean, you rather hire someone that is like your, your complete opposite or give the chance to someone else in the company and do not force people do not force people into that situation. I think that you guys flow correctly together because you both are into the business world. Um, but not everyone does. I, I, and I think that's, that's your, my opinion as well. I've learned the hard way guys. Uh, Cause I wanted to also get my, 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 my girlfriend at the time to come in and work and work on different things. Uh, but it was just forced, right? But then she was able to see that, hey, I made some money with the business. Now I can hire her as a W2 and she's kind of getting into it a little bit. Uh, but it's, it's, it's things like that that will 
will give you more peace. Stop stressing that your partner is not in the same entrepreneurial type of uh, world as you. Yeah. Yeah. So, guys, first of all, I want to tell you so much. Like, thank you so much for being here. Uh, but I also want people to come uh, come in and listen to you to get, take something from you. What are the uh, the free or not free paid books that you know that has helped each one of you guys to master what you guys do really well with the sales operations systems that people can get? I'll lead this one from a sales perspective when it comes to uh, soft skills meaning tonality and things like that. And some NLP language way of the wolf by Jordan Belford is a phenomenal mm-hmm. book. And I would oh. encourage you to not, don't read the book, listen to the audio book because it's actually Jordan himself going through and pronouncing everything the exact way it's supposed to be pronounced. The tonality he uses, the enunciation, everything is on point. Um, there's a lot of, of golden nuggets in that, in that audio book. Hmm. Yeah, I would say on um, on the op side, you really should read the book Who, Not How, because I think everyone always tries to figure things out on their own. And um, I've really trained myself now to figure out who I can hire, not how to do it. All right. Is that is that also going to help when understanding the way systems you understand, like the way that you understand systems? Or is there something else that you can uh, um, everyone it, thinks I'm like a systems genius, but I just found the right who that knows how to do it. <laughs> that's a really good answer because it ties <laughs> back to that, to that book. <laughs> so who knew how? And the other one is the, the way of the wolf. Yep. Yep. Wow. Guys, how can people follow you? How can people find you in social media? How can people get a hold of you? Yeah. Um, our Instagram is Tiffany high official and Josh high official. Uh, we have a website, Tiffany and Josh high.com. Um, from there you can find, yep. Tiffany and Josh high.com. If you go there, you can find all the ways to connect with us. All right. Uh, will people be able to, uh, maybe approach you in Columbus? See if they ever see you. Like if, if you're in Columbus, Hey, Tiffany, hi. Uh, yeah. is, that, is it easy? Okay. <laughs> Just <laughs> don't good. show up at my office unexpectedly. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure that uh, people know that when I went and took this two days, it was um, one of the most, uh, for me, it was a real experience to have as a student, someone that truly is going to give you almost everything they got in short up amount of period of time. And also, uh, whenever we were talking on this bar, all right. Whenever we were having lunch, uh, you can truly see that these individuals, they know what they're talking, but the the whole reason of them doing the amount of money that they, they make is because they help a lot of people and they, they really want to help a lot of people. The more people you help, I believe it, the more sales you make and the more that you are able to make money. Um, so they truly care. I think that they're going to be the best mentor that you could, you could ever have if you go and, and work with them. What's your program called? What's my what? Your program. Oh, um, results driven REI. Um, but you can go to the virtual group.com or the two day workshop.com and learn about our two main products. Okay. That's awesome. Thank you guys for listening to this channel. Again, share it away with your circle. Spotify, Apple Podcast. If you guys got something out of this, I really want you guys to just uh, also go and uh, follow Tiffany High and Josh High on Instagram, and at the same time give uh, give us a review. And I think that I love this episode. I want you guys to do also get the most out of this. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Stay awesome. Stay awesome.